Hey, what's up everybody? It's Leeds, and we're back for some more Gwent, and today we're playing in standard mode using a game-breaking deck with the most highly anticipated card in Gwent history, with infinite points, damage, and card advantage. So let's go give it a look. So today we'll be playing a Monsters Overwhelming Hunger Deathwish deck that is built around the brand new Dagon. We'll talk more about the specifics for him in just a second. The big picture, he actually has two forms, a form that he begins in, and then a form that he transforms into once you have won one round. So kind of like the evolving cards that we've seen in the past, although in this case, the condition that makes him transform is after winning a round. So talk more about him later on because he is something we're going to play in round two or round three. So let's start by what our round one win condition is. And for the most part, we're going to be building around Haunt. So, of course, play a bunch of Death Wish cards and get a bunch of extra value from those cards in that case. So, the combination of Haunt and a bunch of Bronze Death Wish cards is hopefully enough with things like Rot Fiend, Siren, Foglet, Vran Warrior, which if you can get this on the board before you start doing all that consumption, can get a crazy amount of points because you might be consuming two or even three units in one turn. Arcaspore for some thinning and more Death Wish. Slizzard for some additional consumption, we might save that for round three though, and Bridge Troll as well. So those are generally the types of cards that we want to get. Oh, and Andrega Eggs as well. That with Haunts, and the Haunt gives you the consumption to trigger the Death Wish as well as Andrega Warrior. And if necessary, if you need a little more firepower in round one, you can also throw in a Ruhin, which recently got reworked and is now much stronger than it used to be. Now, not only will it come out of your graveyard whenever you consume it, it will also consume your lowest card. So with some good planning, you can consume multiple Death Wish units per turn, which is why we can get a lot of value in round one. So that's the round one win condition. But then there's Dagon, and the art is just amazing. The key thing with him is that initially, he starts with one set of abilities, but then once you've won that round, he transforms. And we actually prefer the second group of abilities that he has once he does that transformation. So although we do need Dagon for this deck, we're saving him for round two or round three. So he transforms into this Dagon Risen. Once that happens, he becomes the most powerful Death Wish unit in the game. With a Death Wish that gets stronger, the longer you wait to destroy him. If you consume him immediately, just going to summon the lowest power bronze death wish unit from your graveyard onto the same row that's not bad but he costs 14 provisions so you're definitely looking for a little bit more than that after two turns he will boost all units in the row by one after three turns spawn storm on the opposite row on your opponent's side for two turns giving you some damage as well and then after that damage the lowest power enemy units by two and then the key thing is if you can get dagon to stay on the board for five turns and then consume him he will spawn a base copy of himself in your hand that is incredible because it's basically card advantage like you might get with Siri and these Stack. counters so if you consume them after five turns you're activating all of these which is incredible value and that may sound great but what if we had unlimited Dagons we do that by first protecting Dagon with a cave troll then we're going to try to put Dagon in that row immediately because the longer he goes unanswered, the more powerful that Death Wish ability is going to become. But that's not all, because on our next turn, we'll put Itaran in that same row, hiding behind our defender. And in the meantime, Dagon is, of course, continuing to increase his counter, becoming stronger. Then after that, we can also put the Slizzard in that row as well. That'll be a consistent source of consumption. Then we can either stall for another turn or two and wait until Dagon gets up to that five counter ability right there and get a amazing value when we do consume Dagon, or we can start going into the consumption. The way we want to do that is by consuming him initially with the Arrakis Queen. So of course this will trigger however many stacks of that Death Wish ability we have on our original Dagon. But then if we destroy Arrakis Queen, we can also create additional Dagons. So before we actually destroy Arrakis Queen, First, we use Abaya to trigger the Death Wish ability, and that way we get an extra free Dagon. And because we still have Itaran in that row, we're getting another extra Dagon as well. Then, on our next turn, we can actually consume the Arrakis Queen, and in doing so, spawn in a Dagon. And because we're still presumably going to have Itaran on the board, that means an extra Dagon there as well. So that's four Dagons, and if any of them was already at that five counter when you used them, then you also drew into a Dagon. So once we've done that, we've lots of Dagons on the board. At that point, we are trying to wait as long as possible before we use them, because again, the longer we wait on Dagon, the stronger the Death Wish becomes. One way we can increase the value of Dagon is once you have them all on the board, you strategically 
actually play Mata then, because when both players draw a card, it is functionally increasing the length of round three or round two or whenever you're doing this. And he wants the round to go as long as possible once Dagon is on the board so that Dagons become as strong as possible. This is what can potentially allow you to get a Dagon up to five turns on that counter. Then once you consume those Dagons using your Slizzard and your leader ability or any other consumption units you have, you'll get a Dagon back into your hand. And if you have enough Dagons, you can potentially add a Dagon to your hand every turn and just replay that Dagon every turn and basically turn it into a never ending cycle of Dagons, which is amazing because it gives you infinite points, infinite damage, and infinite card advantage. So if you can pull that off, it is quite literally the best combo in the game. It's not easy, but if you can pull it off, there's nothing like it. I'm looking forward to it, so let's go see it in action. All right, so going up against monsters here, and for this first match, I want to show you a game in which our opponent does not have much control, and so we can set up our combo without any major interruptions so that you can see what the ideal setup will be. Then for the next one, I'll show you a match in which our opponent does have more control, so we need to adapt and compromise a bit with a modified version of the combo. In this match, we're looking for Haunt plus Bronze Deathwish cards in round one, and then saving Dagon and other Dagon duplication setup cards for round three. Ruhin is also a nice addition in round one to give us a little bit of extra firepower. And if we play that Fran Warrior before we do all of our consumption, we can set it up to get a lot of boosts every turn. We don't have Haunt in our hand, but we can use our stratagem to get it on our next turn. But before we do that, I'm going to play the Slizzard here, because although we will get a lot of consumption from Haunt, Slizzard in the melee row combined with Ruhin gives us a ton of additional consumption every turn. This is, however, a little bit greedy, because we would still like to have a Slizzard in round 3 as well. And they start with Andrega Larva, and that, of course, at least suggests that they are playing a Thrive deck, which tends to have very little, if any, control at all. So with that in mind, that might affect how aggressive we are in round 3 with Dagon. One of the tricky things in round one is we have a ton of cards that we want to play in round three, and we have many of them in our hand. They're good cards that we want to see, we just don't want to see them yet. So if round one goes long, we might be forced into playing them. So in this round, we can use Onero to get the haunt that we were missing, and then in round two or round three, we can use the echoed copy of Onero to still get Iteran back. Next, they go Beast, which once we start consuming stuff, will get pretty big, but we haven't done any of that yet, so it's not a threat at this point. And because of their relatively slow start, I think we can be patient as well here, going with the Ran Warrior next, because he will get boosted every time we do consumption, and of course, we're about to do a whole lot of that. In other circumstances, Ran Warrior is probably one of our weaker cards that you might even want to mulligan, because you need to play him early to get good value out of him, and typically, you have other cards that are pretty high priority to play early as well. And that Kashe is an amazing card that absolutely confirms that they are a Thrive deck. Just a little bit odd to see them playing that directly from hand in round one. Usually you'd use Carinthir to create a copy of it in one round and then play the original copy in a different round, but now they can't do that. Now I want to play Ruin, but it's a little bit tricky to use here. I want to be able to consume it every turn in the melee row with the Slizzard, but if we played Ruin there, we would trigger Haunt, consume it with Bargess, then Ruin would come out and consume our lowest unit, which would be the Slizzard, breaking that combo. So by triggering Haunt with a different Deathwish unit instead and consuming that with the Bargess, we can still pull off the Ruin combo starting on our next turn. More Thrive support with that Necker Warrior, but the Kashe has not hit its Adrenaline ability yet, so that's just a drone, not in Trigger Larva in this case. And now we can play Ruin because this will trigger the last round of Haunt, giving us a lot of weaker units on the board so that when Ruin gets consumed, it will not come out and immediately destroy our Slizzer. Which means we can also consume Ruin with our other consumption cards without worrying about losing one of our important cards. Because with Slizzard still alive, we can consume Ruin again on our next turn and continue to do Bunch of Consumption, powering up that Vrain Warrior even further. But that combo scared them off, they'll pass here, and we'll take the round one win. Carried by the combination of Haunt, Ruin, and other Consumption plus Deathwish combos. And we have played one more card than our opponent, so we probably won't look to push here in round two, although we do draw into some great cards between Oniro, Triss, and Mata. The only things we're missing here for a round three combo would be Itaran, but we could get that with Oniro, and ideally a consumer with either our second Slizzard or the Were Rat. So we'll keep this hand, and because we do have a throwaway card here, let's use Triss Butterflies to get one of those units that we want to see in round three. Siren does give us a little consumption, but we'd like something that is more all-out consumption. So we'll get Itaran here and then likely use Onero to get the Slizzard in round three. More Thrive for them, and those are decent engines, and of course we're not really planning on playing further in this round, so cards that are largely wasted in this round. 
because we're about to pass, and they still need to play something else to catch us. Granted, they theoretically have a card to burn here, so it shouldn't be a huge factor. And Bridge Troll is a decent throwaway, although the Death Wish is a little bit intriguing there. Are they going to have more Death Wish synergies in their deck? Because we've seen pretty much exclusively Thrive thus far. All right, and so this is going to be our Dagon round, and because we won round one, he is transformed and is now in his Death Wish form. So our goal is to get our Cave Troll out to protect him and then play Dagon and create as many copies of him as possible, ideally getting him all the way up to that fifth ability on his Death Wish. In which case, we still get all the smaller stuff, which does add up quite a bit, but that fifth round is the big one that gives us the extra Dagon in hand, which is huge, because that means card advantage and another copy of a really powerful unit. And if we can do that for enough Dagons, we can sustain that indefinitely, giving us infinite points, damage, and card advantage, making us pretty much unstoppable. And we see them break out the haunt there. We saw a little bit of a hint of that in the previous round when they did play Death Wish Unit, but they're looking to do something similar to what we did in round one, I suppose. And as I was saying before, it's Cave Troll first just to play it safe, then we'll play Dagon in the same row on our next turn. Oh, and Weavis, and that is a very powerful Death Wish setup card, and I considered using it in this deck because it does have a lot of synergies with what we're trying to do as well, but was just a little too inconsistent for me to feel worth doing. But now we play Dagon behind the Defender, and the question you always need to ask yourself at this point is, how long can we wait before we need to consume Dagon? Because the longer we wait, the stronger it gets. And if things go well, this will be just the first of many Dagons. They play a Phantom, which gives them a little bit of boost, a little bit of damage, but nothing that is terribly concerning here. No immediate threat to Dagon. And so now we start to set up our Dagon duplication strategy. The key pieces here are Itaran, Arrakis Queen, and Abaya. We're also going to need some consumption, ideally coming from a Slizzard, but if necessary, you could use your leader ability instead. And if you don't think your opponent is about to preemptively destroy or lock Dagon, then you have a little bit of flexibility with the order in which you play those cards. Speaking of which, that looks a little familiar. Though in their case, they're creating extra phantoms, which I don't think is a huge concern. With enough of them, they might have enough damage to break through our defender, but I don't think they're going to be able to do that quickly enough to cause us any real trouble. So now we still need to play Slizzard, Abaya, and Arrakis Queen. Slizzard will eventually be our primary consuming unit, but we don't need it to do that yet, and it doesn't have zeal, so I'll play it this turn to give ourselves a little more time to power up Dagon before it gets consumed. And they are continuing to do the same type of thing that we are trying to do, just the card we're creating copies of is going to be much stronger than the card that they are creating copies of. So for that reason, I'm still not concerned as they continue to set that up. The next card for our combo would be a Rockus Queen consuming Dagon. However, if we wait one more turn, we can get Dagon fully powered up with the fifth counter of his Death Wish ability, giving us that extra Dagon in our hand. For that reason, and because the round can still go long enough for us to get the fifth counter on our subsequent Dagons that we create, it's okay for us to stall on this turn by playing one of the cards that is not necessary necessary for that combo. And the extra consumption from the Siren is going to be useful in a little bit, which is a nice little bonus. More Death Wish for them here, but still nothing that changes the outlook of this match. Though it does trigger the last round of Haunt. And now Dagon is fully powered on his fifth counter, which means it is the perfect time to consume him with a Rockus Queen. Make sure you play a Rockus Queen in the melee row, because that is what determines where the subsequent Dagons show up, and we want them to be in the same row as that Slizzard. And with that fully powered Dagon Death Wish triggering, we get the Dagon in our hand, the two damage on two of their units on their side of the board, the Storm on their side of the board, we boosted every unit in the melee row, and we also summoned our weakest Death Wish unit from our graveyard. So that's one fully powered Dagon, but we want more. And you'll notice I didn't consume the Arrakis Queen on that turn despite having two consumption units because we want to use Abaya on our next turn to get an extra round of the Death Wish on the Arrakis Queen before she actually gets destroyed. And now they're consuming their Arrakis Queen to get an extra copy of their Apiarian Phantom. And throwing in leader ability for good measure. And now we want to get more Dagons with their timers starting as quickly as possible, because we want to activate that fifth round of the Death Wish to create even more Dagons in our hand before the end of the match. But it means either playing the Dagon directly from our hand, or using a Baya on a Rockus Queen to spawn in a Dagon, and getting the extra Dagon spawned from Itaran. Technically speaking, if I'm nitpicking, it would have been slightly better to have done a Baya first, because it would get an extra Dagon on the board one turn faster. Depending on how many turns you have left in the match, that may or may not be an important factor, but in this case, it shouldn't make a difference. But we'll do that now, and Abaya's row does not matter, and so usually I like to play him in whatever row I'm not using all the Dagons, because that row is going to get pretty crowded. So that's one Dagon from Abaya, and one indirectly from Itaran. 
However, you'll notice that I'm not consuming a Rockus Queen yet because our melee row is full and because Iteran can only activate once per turn and we've already used him this turn. They continue with more Death Wish and Consumption, but still nothing major here. And it's important to note that they have only one card left and we still have Mata in our hand. And she stops working once they pass. That means that this turn, we have to use Mata. And in this case, it's not because we need a specific card in our hand, it's just because we want to give both players a card in general, because that's going to make this round go longer and give us more time to power up our Dagons before they get consumed. And at this stage, we want more Dagons, we can create more Dagons, but our melee row is full. Which means before we consume that Arrakis Queen, we need to consume something else first. The safe play is to consume the Noon Wraith with Siren and then consume one of the rats that it spawns in with the Slither. That gives us a spot in our melee row, but delays our Dagons by another turn. For that reason, this is also the turn where I get really greedy, in large part because they don't have much control. So I'll actually consume the Cave Troll to create space. That way we can still consume a Rockus Queen on this turn to create two Dagons on this turn and get their timer started immediately. One from the Arrakis Queen, and one again from Itaran. Now we're defenderless, and although they have enough damage to destroy some of these Dagons, they know that if they do so, that will trigger those Death Wish abilities, which would win us the match. Putting them in a nasty, lose-lose situation. For that reason, they have to settle for hitting low-priority cards like Mata. Now we need to wait one more turn before we can start consuming our assembly line of Dagons, because none of their Death Wishes have reached their fifth counter yet. So that means this card isn't too important and we'll just throw down a Were Rat. And because we don't need Slizzard to consume a Dagon on this turn, we can instead consume one of our other Death Wish cards, giving us more points and more room in our melee row. And they've run out of board space, so they can't even play their last card. They're still in the lead, but we got significant card advantage from all those Dagons, and this is where it gets even more interesting. Because we can consume a Dagon, to gain a Dagon, and then play a Dagon. Continuing our Dagon assembly line. And now, because we have enough Dagons and enough consumption to consume those Dagons, we can add a Dagon to our hand every turn and continue this combo indefinitely. That means infinite boosts, infinite damage, and infinite cards making this the strongest combo in the game. And I know we technically have already beaten them here, but I want to show you how all these Dagons work at this stage in the process. Because you do still need to be careful that you don't run out of row space in your melee row. As we just saw, we consumed a Dagon, but we got out one of our Death Wish units from our graveyard, and that meant our melee row was still full, so I couldn't play this Dagon in the melee row, unless, technically speaking, you could use your lead ability there, because if that row is full, it will destroy a card, but it will not spawn in an Ekimara, so technically that would have made room to play the Dagon in that melee row, so that that way the Slizzard can continue to be our dead dedicated Dagon consumer, though in that case I used Leader Ability to consume a Dagon and that got out another Death Wish card from our graveyard, though fortunately it was a Siren which also can consume stuff so eventually we still cleared out some room. You just need to be careful about that if you're truly trying to go infinite because if we didn't have that second Leader Ability charge still remaining, we might not have a way to consume that Dagon that I played in our range row. In this case we've already passed them so it doesn't matter, but if we were still behind them then that could have been a difference maker that eventually could have stopped us from continuing this combo. But in case you had any doubts, here's your proof that it is truly an infinite point, infinite damage, infinite card combo. Because at this point, we could do this as long as we want. And here's that turn I was talking about where we need something to consume the Dagon in the range row, which because we can't do that with the Slizzard, we need some other source. We can do that with Onero, we can do that with our leader ability, but if you're not careful, you could find yourself in a situation where you can't pull that off. But once we've done that, we can go back to consuming the Dagons in the melee row with the Slizzard, and playing the Dagons in the melee row where Slizzard can continue to do that consumption going forward, getting us back to a sustainable combo. So there you have it. That is the power of Dagon. Alright, so the previous match shows you what we can do when we get our infinite Dagon combo set up. This time I'll show you how we adapt when our opponent has more control to slow down our combo, so that even if we don't go infinite, we can still win. Our overarching win conditions are still very similar. Round 1 is all about Haunt plus Bronze Death Wish units so that we win that round and evolve Dagon so he transforms into his second form, which we can then use as our win condition for Round 2 or Round 3. So here we're trying to get enough Bronze Death Wish to set ourselves up for Round 1 while still saving a few of those key cards for Round 3. And unfortunately, no haunt in our starting hand, but we can use Oniromancy to get it.
And interestingly, looks like we're gonna have a scenario showdown here in round one, Vayne Death versus Haunt. Last time we were a little more patient with our setup, but I think this time we go with Rot Fiend so that we can immediately destroy the engine that they just set up. Granted, now it is a second commando and that will also trigger the next chapter of their scenario. Now let's use our stratagem, and one thing we're missing here is, in the previous match, we also had Ruin in round one, which is really nice when combined with Haunt, but unfortunately, this would be our only way of getting it, but I don't think we can afford to do that when we otherwise might not have a way to guarantee that we see Dagon. But for now, we're back to combining Haunt with Deathwish. Okay, and this is where we start to learn more. This is not just an elf deck. Looks like this is actually an elf traps deck, which is an important distinction because it means they could have a lot of control here. But we'll keep playing little Deathwish cards because we don't care if those get destroyed by traps. But that doesn't trigger the trap, so I hope that's not hitting everything in that row. Otherwise, there is a fair bit of stuff there. And more traps here. That first one did not activate at the end of their turn, so that means it's not the one that hits all the units in our most crowded row. So I'm guessing, what, probably a Serpent Trap? And then maybe the other one is a Horn? We don't have any Consumption left unless we use a Leader Ability Charge or play this Slizzard, which I don't really want to do. We could drop the Indrega Eggs and just see if they get instantly destroyed and trigger that Death Wish. But I'll be a little bit bold here and pass, and see if that forces them to manually activate one or both of those traps for less value. Okay, and it's one horn. Oh, and a second horn? No. Okay, I expected one, but definitely not two. Now they've just bamboozled me. And that extra little boost at the end from the commando, which is just enough for them to take the round one win. Very well played. And now you start to see what I was referring to. Our plan is already a little muddled because they won on even with that clever maneuver there, so they may very well be able to get into round three with card advantage, giving us a much tougher test of just how effective Dagon can be. Remember, Dagon only transforms once we win a round, so he is still in his original form, which we do not want to use. So we need to find a way to win round two while still holding on to Dagon and hopefully at least some of the components to help set him up in round three. But as I alluded to before, this is the type of situation where we may need to adapt and make some compromises rather than going infinite Dagon or bust. They'll start with Sabertooth Tiger, which is a great card when they're on blue coin. We could potentially just feed a Deathwish unit to it, so let's start with Foglet. Not my preferred Deathwish unit, because in this case, if they flip their Sabertooth Tiger, then he may not take the damage, but we'll see. And they'll go way late to destroy it. <laughs> but fortunately for us, that Deadeye got spawned in the Rainfur, where there is now a bunch of fog, so we actually will be able to deal damage with it. But pacing-wise, this turn is still really tough, because I don't think we have anything that can catch them in one turn. That, and we have a bunch of cards in our hand that we want to save for round three. In which case, might as well play Triss and swap out one of those cards that we want to play in round three for something that we could use here in round two. So let's get rid of Itaran and replace him with Ruhin. Normally, we would save Triss for round three to get other cards for the Dagon combo, but as we were saying before, this is going to be one of those compromises. They'll take damage from our Fog, but Triss will take damage from the Sabertooth Tiger. And yeah, that's definitely the right move for them to pass there, because now we're going to need to go a card down in round three. So obviously now we really need to catch them on this turn, which is why we use Triss to get Ruin. Because it's just enough points that if we play it here, their Deadeye will still take one damage from the weather effect, and that'll be just enough for us to take the round two win. But we're a card down, so this is where we see if Dagon can still lead us to victory in round three. All right, so we're a card down here, but we do still have access to all the cards that we need. We don't have Iteran, but we could get him with Oniromancy. The thing that we're missing more than anything would be Mata to extend the rounds, powering up Dagon's Deathwish ability before we eventually consume him. So that's what we're looking for with our mulligans. However, Siren was probably our next best card, so for that reason, I'm gonna settle here and stick with that. At this point, I'm pretty sure Oniro into Mata would give us Iteran, so that does theoretically still give us access to all the cards we're looking for, although the order of operations there could get a little bit awkward. We did get our Defender down, so now that means it's time for Dagon. Alright, and now it's a trap, and this is potentially a big problem. 
The next play in the combo would usually be either Slizzard or Itarand, but Slizzard gets destroyed by Springtrap. Fortunately, we have two of them, so we could play one and see if it gets destroyed. And it was not a Springtrap, so that Slizzard is safe, but that still complicates Itarand. Because we have to use Onir Mancy to get Mata to get Itarand, and if that's a Serpent Trap, then that's going to destroy Dagon too early. And now with two traps on the board, certainly one of those is Serpent Trap, right? So we'll use Siren as a sacrificial lamb to see if we can figure out what at least one of those things is. And it was Spring Trap, so she gets destroyed, but she boosts our adjacent units. Technically speaking, we could have positioned her to boost Cave Troll and Slizzard, and then Cave Troll would be the highest card, not Dagon. Then, if we use Oniromancy, even if that is a Serpent Trap, at least it's going to destroy something other than Dagon. But I still think we need that Cave Troll, so I'm not sure that's a sacrifice that we could make anyway. But more traps, and at this point, that Slizzard was probably the card we were most willing to sacrifice. And importantly, Dagon's Death Wish ability is now fully powered up. And that's my plan. Assuming one of these things is a Serpent Trap, at least now if we use Oniromancy, we'll destroy Dagon and we'll still get the full value out of him. Which, given all these traps that we've had to play around, seems like a reasonable compromise. And there's the confirmation. Yes, that very first trap that they played was in fact a Serpent Trap, so good thing that we took note of that possibility and planned accordingly, because as we see here, we still get decent value out of Dagon, including adding one to our hand. The traps truly are endless, though. And now we'd like to play Dagon as quickly as possible to get his Death Wish powered up as quickly as possible. However, if that's a Pitfall Trap, then that could be pretty painful. But we still have some armor on Cave Troll. We have a Death Wish unit on the board, so if we take some damage, it's still painful, but hopefully not the end of the world. Yeah, I think the damage got split in just about the best possible way for us there. And finally, something that is not a trap, and at this point, the Swordmaster is late enough that that's probably not too much of a threat. And that means we can still use whatever remnants we have left of our Dagon combo, like Itaran. And I'm a little wary of running out of space in the melee row, as we saw in our previous match. However, in case they happen to have Brahan, I'd like to have a weak one-power rat at the end of the row. Pretty darn unlikely, but just in case. And Whisper, another engine that I'm not sure how much they're going to be able to set up here. And now we have another very interesting and difficult decision to make. We're starting to run out of time in this round, so the only way we'll be able to consume a Dagon that has its fully powered Death Wish ability would be if we keep the current Dagon on the board for two more turns. But that comes at a humongous cost, because that would require that we play Were Rat next, then a Baya with nothing to trigger the Death Wish on, and then a Raucous Queen on our very last turn. Basically, bricking two Dagons on the board from a Baya in order to get one Dagon in our hand, and more of the other Death Wish triggers from our existing Dagon. So, really hard to crunch all those numbers in my head, but as you can see here, I went with Were Rat, so I'm choosing to focus on the Dagon that we currently have on the board, reaching five stacks, so that we get a fully powered Death Wish from him, including getting a Dagon back into our hand. But this is exactly what I meant before. Tough decisions that could go either way, as to how we ought to compromise when our Dagon setup doesn't go as smoothly as it went in the previous match. So now this is the turn where we make that Abaya sacrifice that we were talking about before. With Dagon at four stacks, this is still a very strong death wish for us to trigger, it's just that this was originally planned to be on a Rockets Queen to give us another Dagon altogether. That does still seem like pretty solid value, and we can use the Slizzard here to consume the Night Wraith for even more wraps. They'll hit us for a bit of damage, but we have to assume that one of these last cards is Eldane, so their finisher is probably to transform all these traps into three-point Elven Deadeyes. That will be worth a lot of points, but we are now ready to consume our Dagon, and that means even more Storm in their melee row, which should hit those Deadeyes for a fair bit of damage. Which, maybe they realize because they did a good job slowing down Dagon, but they forfeit. So there's a look at a crazy Monsters Dagon deck for Standard Mode. If you liked the video, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button, and leave a comment down below to let me know which other cards, archetypes, and factions you'd like us to experiment with next. And should we continue to play a little bit more in Standard, or should we go back to doing Our Battle Will Be Legendary? Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you next time.